glad you could join us here this uh, Saturday morning. Spend a little part of your weekend with us today. Uh, it's going to be a little chilly today, so it's a great time to sit down, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and uh, learn something about gardening. And our first show of 2013. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Hope everybody had say, a say, welcome great to the new year. New year. Did you have a good one? Uh, it's been off to a rough start. Has it? Yeah. Yeah. We'll just. <laughs> We'll just skip over that part. That's right. Okay, okay. Between being sick and home and bad for the I New know. Year's, you know. I'm sorry. That, hey, yeah. That's the way it goes oh, well. sometimes. Well, look at it this way. It can only get better. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. You I go. hope you're right about that. <laughs> Well, today we're going to have we have a great topic because we know the gardens are beautiful in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. The winter, actually the winter can be beautiful as well. You've got some great ideas for us. Yeah, the way I look at it or present it is I mean, I think you can find beauty wherever you look for it. So, of course, you know, as Debbie's saying, hey, you can look out there and you say, well, it's gray, it's cold or it's windy or, you know, you can take that kind of look at it, or you just kind of open your eyes and see the landscape a little differently and find the unique beauty that is available during the winter months. So that's really what our focus is, is just trying to take a little bit of a different look at it. And of course, we'll be um, pr presenting several plants and ideas and suggestions of things that you could include in your landscape to really make the best of this season. Great. Okay, well before we get started, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, wanted to let you know, or remind you actually, because we talked about this last week, that our after Christmas sale is in full swing at all three Maryfield Garden Center locations. You can get some great bargains to get a head start on Christmas 2013. So we've got 40 to 70 percent off on all of our Christmas items in stock. So hope you'll stop by and take advantage of that. Also mentioned last week, uh, our seminars begin on January 19th. So if you're on on our mailing list, you should be receiving this hopefully within the next week or so. Um, it's got the entire seminar schedule on it. We do have them at the Garden Center if you want to stop by and pick one up. They're available on our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to learn more about gardening. It, it goes goes through the month of April um, and it's got we, basically every Saturday as we get closer to April, there'll be some Sunday um, seminars at our Gainesville location as well. So lots of great topics from gardening to landscaping to even cooking. Yeah, and we've got not only our own staff, but several special guests right. that we bring in to do it. So uh, it's a big, diverse group. And like I said, at all three stores. And some of them we repeat, so if you're not able to get to one, maybe you can yes. get to the others when you have those kind of mm -hmm. conflicts. And wanted to mention as well our hours at Maryfield Garden Center. Now that we're past the holiday season and settled into the winter season, we'll be open at all three locations from Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. and on Sundays from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. So we are open all winter long at Maryfield Garden Center. We, we just close a couple of days a year, uh, so it's a great place to come, especially if it's a winter day and it's cold and you want to come in the greenhouse and just really take a look and get some warmth and relax and some beauty. So. Great. All right, let's get started. Yeah, well, we'll start with some pictures of right here. Like I said, we're talking about the landscape in winter, mm -hmm. but our first picture is really showing the landscape sort of in the middle of summer. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, we talk about gardening. Uh, this is the sort of thing we're daydreaming about. And of course, I'm already have customers, you know, they're coming in and this, you know, we, we're just getting started on winter, but you know, getting through the holidays and it's cold outside and stuff, you just kind of start looking ahead to the days of late spring and summer when everything's in bloom, you know, the trees have mm -hmm. leafed out in lush foliage and beauty that's out there. And of course, this is a glorious time in the garden. It's nice to look forward to. But if we look at this exact same garden in the winter time, you know what? It still has a beauty of its it own. It really does. Uh, the color is the first thing that's gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the first thing that you notice in the winter time. Everything's just sort of gray and you might even say bleak looking. But when I look at it, I start to say, hey, you can really see the structure of the garden, see the bones of it. Uh, especially when it is covered in a blanket of snow, it really accentuates. Uh, before the arbor that was back there was covered in the wisteria, now you can see the structure of the arbor that's there. You can see the structure of the walks and the walls that have been defined. Uh, and also the trees themselves, you know, their branching is really enhanced because the leaves have gone. And I tell you, when I'm looking at trees, that's a lot of what I'm looking for is the branching structure that's in there. You can see the plums back there with the nice rounded form that's in that. Um, in the way, way background, you see the taller trees of the forest behind it. So that's the first thing to me that I look at in the winter time. Now we look at sort of the next picture. Um, 
again, lush and beautiful that's in there. And we look at the color is what pops out. You see the wax begonias in there. And this is um, definitely what annuals will do for you, um, is that the annuals give you that pop of color, that continuous bloom. So I think they definitely have an invaluable role in the garden but also a lot of the perennials back there. You see the ferns and the host and the conicola. Uh, and this is probably a picture that's taken, you know, in kind of May, June time frame. And this is at your house, right? So you, yeah, this you, is, what a view you have to look out at there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a little front yard, mm -hmm. uh, townhouse front yard, but I try to mix a little bit of everything that's in there. But what I do is I like to rotate color through there. And so if you were to look at this same picture in the middle of winter, this is what it would look like. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's not as lush and gorgeous uh, going on there. But what's happened is the pansies are great for providing a little bit of winter interest in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the begonias are gone. Uh, the pansies are in there now. Of course, they look like wilted spinach right. and stuff when they've got <laughs> the frost on. You might see a little splash of the blue in there. So the point is that they're winter annuals. They'll provide a little bit of color that's in there, and they can pop up. And when you have a nice warm day like we're supposed to have later this week, they'll pop up and their flowers will be plump and juicy looking. Or like I said, when the frost is on, they kind of lie down a little bit wilted. But one of the things I wanted to point out in there, the, um, the autumn fern that's behind it, I find I use a lot of perennials, evergreen perennials in my landscape, provide that interest throughout the entire season. So you've got the, um, the ferns right there mm -hmm. behind it. And of course, that kind of cola there has gone dormant. Well, and you're also able to see the stone. Yeah, exactly. That stone, which was hidden before, mm -hmm. you know, adds a little bit of an accent that's in there. And then you can find color even during the winter time that you'll see in our next picture. And that's where the hellebores are, are so invaluable in the garden. Now, the hellebores typically are, f are flowering kind of February, March time period. I uh, just put this one there showing even popping up through a little bit of snow so the cold doesn't set them back mm -hmm. at all. And it's a great collection of plants because they are evergreen uh, with their foliage, but then also, like I said, you can get these flowers showing uh, even during the cold months of winter. Now, I brought a couple others in. Now, these were in our greenhouse. You know, it's an unheated greenhouse in the perennials, mm -hmm. so they're out there in the cold, but that's allowed them to come into bloom. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little bit ahead of time, but I want to sort of show the variety of colors that are out there. Because when you showed in that picture, it's kind of a, a dull, blase green, but you can get even these kind of deep burgundy colors that are mm -hmm. showing up in there. Uh, I and I brought there another one here uh, that's not flowering yet, but you can see uh, from the buds that are going to show up in here that that's going to open to a nice white color color showing up in here. So again, hellebores, nice plant, deer resistant, shade tolerant, um, blooms there during times when uh, nothing else giving you a color. That's a nice way that you can kind of enhance the landscape in mm -hmm. winter. Yeah, see a little of the white showing out. There we go. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, these are great suggestions, but we've got more. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking about the beauty of the winter landscape in today's show, so we've got some great ideas for you. Yeah, so again, I, we've got some pictures here that we'll just start off the discussion with. It's going to begin with a summer view of the landscape, and but that gives a chance to compare and contrast right. mm -hmm. with how it can look in the wintertime. Uh, so again, of course this is beautiful, you know, I don't have to tell you that, but you, you've got this color in there and the soothing shade and kind of leading you down the bridge back there. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, when we get these cold days, and it's um, nice to sort of visualize that. You know, I've started looking through my garden catalogs. Right. Uh, you know, they're coming in now. And that's always the fun. They, some people, I, I remember one time hearing, the garden never looks better uh, than it does right now this time of year because it's just all in your mind. Right. You know, and, and, <laughs> and you're looking at these catalogs and daydreaming and, and these pictures and kind of thinking about, oh, this is what I've got to look forward to. But, you know, if you take the same view and you look out the window um, now or maybe later tonight mm -hmm. after you get a little dusting of snow on it, this is the kind of image you might see. Uh, if we'll go to our next picture. So again, you still see uh, the bridge going back there in the background, the overhang of the magnolia and stuff. But um, of course, I'm using snow pictures because it, it really does 
accentuate uh, the beauty of the branching right. and stuff out there. So you can even see on the magnolia a little bit of snow collecting in the foliage and everything. But hey, you know what, if you just kind of open your eyes to it uh, and take a little different perspective, to me it's still gorgeous, it's still attractive uh, that's out there, mm -hmm. even if it's not all the bright colorful flowers. Um, we had mentioned, again, not just trees and evergreens, but also perennials. So here's another view of, again, you know, looking sort of my front yard that's there. So you've got little boxwood um, in the foreground, but of course it's the uh, heuchera or the coral bells with sort of the, uh, that's a variety it's called pistache that has sort of the yellow leaves and of course the conicola, the grasses that are back there. Uh, hard to see, but a little cryptomeria that's in there. But of course, so the perennials, um, again, this is in a shade environment, so I'm using leaf color and leaf texture to get a little bit of contrast and color that's going on in there. But one of the reasons I love using these perennials, and, and again, in a confined space, is here's that same image looking in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little harder to see, you know, and they're diminished in size, but the the uh, heuchera, the coral bells, they're still there. They're providing a little bit of evergreen or winter interest that's in there, still adding a little bit of color. And also with the um, grasses in the background, the Hakanakoa there providing a little bit of structure and background to it. So that's, I think, a nice way that we can use perennials in the landscape. And I brought a couple others in the show that are that are evergreen perennials, because I know most of the time we talk about perennials, we're thinking about things like phlox and peonies that, of course, go dormant during the winter time and the top part of the plant dies off. And that's true and they're beautiful, but also look at them for their foliage. So this is Carex. It's actually, it's a type of sedge. It's a variety it's called Evergold that has that nice color in the leaf. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several varieties. You can get sort of solid green, a light green, even kind of a a maroon brown color, but this I like has sort of that curly look and it adds some color to it. Right, it's got this variegation, which I, I hope they're able to see on there. Right. Now the Carex is an evergreen, uh, so year after year this clump just gets a little bit bigger, it spreads a little bit wider, uh, but it's going to give you interest throughout the entire year. Again, the flowers on this are really dull, they're actually unattractive and probably want to cut them off, mm -hmm. but it's grown for its foliage. So I think that's a nice thing when I'm looking at, uh, at perennials, I'm looking not just at their flowers, but also at their foliage. And I brought in a couple of euphorbia, or what's sometimes called a wood spurge. Uh, again, these will get flowers on them very early in the season as we go into February and March time period. And the flowers are persistent, they last a long time, and they're attractive. Again, here you've got the foliage on there. Uh, again, these plants, all of them that you're looking at, are plants that will tolerate shade. Uh, they're deer resistant. They'll do well in dry shade as well as the, um, the Carex does well even in a moist shade condition. So these are tough, durable plants. Uh, the foliage is out there. Hold that up so you can see a little bit better. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just trying to give you an idea of the variety that's out there. So you can go from solid green to variegated, kind of that burgundy color. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic in containers or nice in the landscape. And that deer resistance is a great quality. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my big thing, of course, is when we're talking about perennials is to not look just at the flowers, but also look at the foliage and the leaves. Now this one I brought in, uh, just getting nostalgic, I actually went out to the perennials house looking for a few evergreens that we could bring in. This is one that's called a uh, strawberry begonia. Uh, I don't see it used very often, actually I don't see anybody um, out there using or buying, <laughs> I guess it's been around so long. But I love this plant mm -hmm. uh, and I look at it because I go back to when I was very young, when I was still um, a tweener I guess mm -hmm. they call them, uh, <laughs> and getting interested in gardening, it's one of the first plants that I grew. Uh, and I love it because this is one that sends runners off. That's where it gets its name, like a strawberry plant. It will send runners off from there and that little runner roots. So a lot of times they're even grown in baskets or hanging baskets to allow the little baby plants mm -hmm. to cascade over. And it's used as a container plant or it can be grown as a ground cover uh, in the landscape. It's got the fuzzy leaves on there like uh, begonias do. I thought, hey, got me interested when I was a kid, maybe it'd be something that could get your that's children right. interested that's in it as right. well. So Fuzzy the, with the runners and everything <laughs> else. So that's strawberry begonia. The winter care for the for Yeah. Perennials. Now, of course, the thing with perennials, and we get this question right now, uh, is sort of what to do with them mm -hmm. right now. And I'm going to use pictures to illustrate that point as well. 
Now there's no really right or wrong way to deal with plants uh, in the landscape. I like to leave the perennials alone. I haven't touched anything, I haven't cut it back because even if I have this dormant foliage or spent blooms like you see on the sedum, it adds some interest. You know, you catch some frost on it and again, I think that adds a little beauty and interest to it. Uh, if it gets to the point where it's raggedy looking and it's not attractive, uh, you could go in and do some pruning and you'll see that in our next picture uh, where somebody's gone in and cut all the old foliage down. It's not a question of right or wrong or it doesn't really matter the plant. Basically my rule is if it's green, any green foliage like on these perennial evergreens, we've, um, perennial, evergreen perennials we've been talking about, I'm going to leave the green untouched but if it's brown you can trim it off like you saw in that picture or you can leave it behind and let it catch a little bit of snow or a little bit of ice or frost on it and add to the beauty of, of your winter landscape. So it's really up to you no however way you want to cut. There's, there's the last one. Ah, oh, beautiful. Really does catch the light. Yeah, so again, I leave it up there and add yeah. that winter interest to it, but that's your call. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, take a quick break and come back and look at some of the trees and shrubs that will really enhance your winter landscape. Okay, we took a look at a few of our of the great perennials in our last segment, but now let's turn to trees and shrubs. Yeah, actually, like I said, every aspect of the garden takes on a different look mm -hmm. and, and has its own uh, distinctive beauty at this time of year. So you're right, we'll just jump right in talking okay. about some of the trees and shrubs that are here. And first one we're going to look at, and um, you know, I've used these pictures before, so you might recognize them, or if you've been to our garden center, you might You'll recognize this. Mm -hmm. this. Uh, this is at the Fair Oaks location. Just as you come in the entrance is this specimen of a uh, weeping blue atlas cedar. Uh, and again, this is great as an accent plant right up there at the, at the entrance because the first thing, of course, you notice is that very distinctive weeping, trailing, drooping form that's on there. The parent plant, of course, is very upright um, and kind of sticky looking. I don't know how else to say that. I mean, when, it, when you see an atlas cedar, uh, they're not full, dense plants. They grow straight up, you know, and, and have just sparse branching off the side. But this one, of course, has that weeping pendulous form. Uh, also brings in that nice powder blue color. And it's the distinctive form and color that really makes it such a great accent and define the entrance that's in there. So it's doing a good job for us there year round. And then when you see this in the winter time, uh, and again, of course, with that frosting of snow on there, it to me, it gets even more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of, as we've talked about in the winter time, it's really the absence of color that everything goes gray. So when you have something like it's, um, it brings out a little bit of a blue tone, that's going to stand out. The snow that collects on it, you know, really accentuates the form that's on there. And I'm hoping we do get a little bit of I snow know, night. Me too. I know they say it's not going <laughs> to be anything and it's not going to accumulate, but you know, we got nothing we'll last year. A nice dusting. Yeah, the couple snows we've had now have mm -hmm. been all slushy. And I know. One of these days, I'm hoping we get a nice fluffy <laughs> snow like this coming in again. So that's something to look for. And again, this this is a plant that you might want to consider using in your own landscape, uh, where you want to draw attention or attract, you know, uh, draw attention or attract uh, people to that part of your landscape. Mm -hmm. Now, behind it in the background, you can see that multi-stem deciduous tree. That's a heritage birch. Uh, that is our native form of birch tree. Uh, a lot of people think of the paper bark birch with that really smooth, peeling, exfoliating bark. You know, we get calls for that all the time around the Christmas holidays to use in the decorations. But that paper bark birch really is a northern species. Uh, when you bring it down this far south under our heat and drought that we have in the summertime, the plant gets stressed, it gets borers. It's just not one that performs well. But this, again, is our native birch heritage, which is just as beautiful. Um, it's just not that smooth bark, but here it's got that peeling, exfoliating, multiple color tones that I are in there. I love the bark. I've seen the bark on this. Yeah, we, we, um, it really is beautiful, and it's just tough as nails. It's durable down here. It's adapted to our environment. So again, it's just taking a little bit of a different look to your landscape. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, not just the structure of trees and shrubs, but also the bark characteristics can become really distinctive. Uh, paper bark maple is another one that a lot of people use as a very similar kind of bark. It's just more of a uh, brownish color rather than the 
the white and tan colors you see here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things, and you look at these plants and see the interest they offer. Another one that's very popular and widely used in the landscape would be crepe myrtle. Uh, and here, you know, out in the middle of a snowstorm, you know, where the, the crepe myrtle, uh, you start to see the branching of that multi-stem uh, type of characteristic it has. Just like the birch tree has multi-stem, you know, the crepe myrtles have multi-stem. If you want to, it could be trained more of a tree form. But this is its natural shape that you see out there in the snowstorm over there, you know, with the bridge just behind it. But when the snow is settled and you get a closer look up at it, you start to see again the bark characteristics on there. And the bark is very smooth. Uh, it starts to, as it mate, matures, it starts to peel and exfoliate. And our next picture there gives a little bit of a close up to it. Again, it's quite, it's hard to really see the beauty of it in these pictures, but out there in real life, oh, yes. you, know, you just mm -hmm. get these multiple colors in there. This is a variety, it's called um, Natchez, it gets the white flower and really has one of the best uh, for the structure and the bark characteristics. Again, very tough, durable plants in the landscape. Summer interest, winter interest, uh, year-round I was going to say, color. it's a multi-purpose plant. It is. And since we're talking about bark, um, because that's another characteristic we look for, uh, particularly in the wintertime, I've got a red twig dogwood showing up. Uh, now, this is a plant that really, to me, it's um, pretty blasé during the summertime. It's the wintertime when it really looks its best, its most dramatic. Uh, what will happen now with these red twig dogwoods, as they age and they mature, that bark starts to get brownish gray and it's less attractive. So a lot of times these are aggressively pruned in late winter to keep this juvenile growth coming up because it's that juvenile growth that has the bright red coloration. So if you have this in your landscape, I would say, hey, you want to enjoy it now during the January, February time period, but by late March, you might want to go in there and even get aggressive with the pruning so you get these young shoots coming up that have that nice red coloration. And there's several different varieties in there that will give you anywhere from red to sort of orange to yellow, uh, so you can play around with different colors there. Great. Well, and of course, berries are wonderful in the landscape. Right, because we've been talking about, you know, evergreens with leaves and mm -hmm. the structure of trees and the bark on some of these shrubs. I thought, hey, also berries. Absolutely. He said. So the um, beauty berry, which is a showstopper, you can see there in late summer mm -hmm. uh, as the berries are starting to mature. But it's kind of interesting, if you watch these, even the berry colors will change a little bit as they expose sort of colder temperatures. So this is really why I'd say it's at its peak in late summer. but. As you go in the winter time, the leaves start to shed and fall off of it. This next picture is the exact same plant. So I thought it was just interesting to sort of watch the berry color change as the cold temperatures got on there. Of course, by this point in time, all the leaves have shed off of it. Nothing left behind except the berries. And as those berries uh, continue to mature, they'll they'll ripen and drop off. If you went out now, by the end of January, they probably wouldn't find any berries at all on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, that's a nice characteristic that plants can add because that's a plant that, again, looks very blasé during the summertime, but as you go into late summer, early winter, really stands out. Another great one for the berries, of course, is the winter berry, which is a holly. Uh, you can see it in the background behind the grasses. This is late summer, again, so the grasses are taking on their fall color. The um, winter berry is taking on its fall color, kind of the yellow leaves, but the red berries have already started to mature. But once the leaves drop off of there uh, is when you start to really see the beauty of it. And I've got the winter picture next. Yeah, again, because the landscape is so gray, anything you can do to add color really draws your no, attention really to does. it. It just jumps out at you. Yeah, so again, a great plant. Now, hot, like Hall Highs, you got pears, you got a boy and a girl, so the girls will give you the um, color. But another, uh, native plant and hybrids and native plants, uh, so they're tough, they're easy to grow. It's just find the right variety for you. And then you can find anywhere from three feet to 12 feet tall. And again, there's even some different berry colors available to you. Great, okay, we're gonna take another quick break and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. We've got a few more uh, suggestions for you before we take our phone calls in the next segment. But uh, you've got a couple of beauties you brought along with you. Yeah, I brought some plants in. I, you know, the pictures are nice, but it's nice right. to bring the real thing in mm -hmm. as well. So I brought a uh, prickly plant collection. Yes, yeah, you brought in. some mean plants over this morning. Yeah, it just kind of <laughs> turned out that way. I was That's looking right. for plants that would be nice for winter interest. Of course, everything turned out to be a little spiny or have a little bite to it. Right. So you can see that blue atlas cedar, the weeping blue atlas cedar. We saw a mature specimen in the pictures, but this was just such a beautiful little one. I mm -hmm. had to grab it and bring it in. It has such great you. structure. Yeah. Of course, what's really um, standing out there is the Mahonia that has those bright yellow flowers on it. Uh, Mahonia is a favorite for the shade garden, woodland garden. Uh, again, you can see the leaves on it. Kind of has a, looks almost like a holly, but it's, it's actually in the barberry family. But the leaves are spiny like a holly, so the deer tend to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I always like to put a plug for that in right. woodland <laughs> gardens. So very distinctive foliage on there. Uh, there are several different varieties. Uh, they typically will flower for you in February, March. There are some that will bloom for you even uh, through the winter time. Uh, I think there's a variety, it's called Charity, it has a longer bloom season. So you can see it's in flower now. Some of them will be fragrant. But as these flowers, as they get pollinated, it develops into sort of a purplish berry. So again, that's where it gets its name, the Oregon grape holly. It kind of looks like a holly. The flowers eventually turn to something that looks a little bit like a cluster of grapes. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I think, a neat accent plant uh, for the landscape because you've got the interest of the foliage as well as the flowers that are on there. Now it's a little more difficult to see, but I also brought in a type of citrus, an orange plant that's mm -hmm. cold hardy in our environment. <laughs> Uh, so it's really kind of distinctive and unique because there's not many citrus trees that will survive the winter here. But this is one's called a hardy orange or a trifoliate orange. Uh, and you can see the dagger-like thorns oh. on there. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, we're, <laughs> Debbie and I are both That's bleeding right. this morning from uh, just bringing that in. Um, this is right, it's called flower or flying dragon. So it gets that name because the branches on it are twisted and contorted. Uh, those thorns and spikes on it make it kind of intimidating to use in most landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, but who knows, you know, you might have the right place for it. Right, if you're trying to keep somebody out of your garden, there you go. Yeah, these were used <laughs> in the old days as living hedges because they would mm. be planted in hedgerows to keep the cattle in place. Oh, yeah. Because nobody's oh. going to try to cut through that on would the do edge it. of these things. But I thought for the winter time, it, sh it does grow, it, the leaves have shed off of there, it would have foliage on in the summertime but the leaves shed off of it. The stems remain green, so it has a little bit of an evergreen look to it. And in this case, that flying dragon with a twisted, contorted p growth pattern would actually be more pronounced in the wintertime than it is in the summertime. It is a very cool looking plant. It's cool, it's tough, it's durable, it's pest free. Uh, just Deer resistant. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody's gonna mess with it, just be aware of the thorns that are on there. Uh, so that's a little bit of a novelty plant you might mm -hmm. want for the winter landscape. Right. Now we'll go back to some things that are a little more uh, gardener pretty. friendly <laughs> uh, and a little prettier. And with these, it's the <laughs> pictures. So there are a few things that we can do to add a little bit of flower color, believe it or mm -hmm. not, even during the winter Absolutely. time. Uh, and so we're going to look at that. Uh, you can see on one side of your screen the yellow twig dogwood. We talked about the red twig dogwood. But next to it is the witch hazel. Uh, of course, I just love plants in the hazel family. I love the witch hazel. You know, you've heard me talk about them over and over. Uh, but this is rice called Arnold's Promise, which has the bright yellow flowers. Again, it would be blooming more towards February time period. Uh, but it's so nice, so nice mm -hmm. to have something blooming uh, in the winter time when everything else is dull out there. So you can see that's the yellow flowered color. There's another one, the hybrid, that I'm showing up in our next picture, a close up of Diane. Uh, there's nothing out there that's a true red, but this is about as close as you're going to find to it in witch hazel. And again, this, these are hybrids where they've taken Asian forms and our native forms, hybridize them together so you get larger, more dramatic flower color going on in there. Uh, again, they'll have great um, fall color. It's actually what I chose to plant in my front yard as a specimen uh, tree because I'm just sort of that much in love with them. Uh, Winter jasmine is another that will bloom for you in the winter time. Uh, and you'll see this coming up. 
It has green stems on it, so the stems actually add a little bit of interest in the wintertime. But as you start going to February, March, uh, these bright yellow flowers open up. Uh, I think is its best use here, kind of cascading over a wall. It looks very much like forsythia, but it blooms earlier than the forsythia it does. does. Mm -hmm. Again, these are really easy care plants. So there's a couple things, not a lot, but a couple things you can get some blooms and flowers on. Uh, but the idea, of course, is to mix all these. And my last picture there is just to sort of show the winter landscape, you know, where you're taking all these plants, mixing them together, evergreens, you know, deciduous trees, you know, shrubs like Nandinas. You can have berries, you can have flowers, you can have bark, you can have leaf Beautiful. color. Interesting form, you know, it's all there for you to see in the winter time. And it's not just the plants, mm -hmm. but even the water garden uh, takes on a different look. Uh, of course, this is, you know, beautiful. We love the sounds of the splashing water in the summertime, but, you know, the icicles in the yeah, wintertime. it's great. Just give you a little different look. Mm -hmm. And even something as, you know, benign as statuary is going to look different. Uh, from summer through winter. Now we have to explain this picture because we, when we, a couple of us looked at it, it's like, what is that? That, that is actually a little girl looking down with a snow cap on. You know, strange. I, I don't feel like it needs any <laughs> you explanation. You saw it right away. But every <laughs> single person that's looked at says, what's that? I know. <laughs> I almost took that picture out of there, but I just love it. <laughs> it's great. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls. So if you have any gardening questions, 703-387-1046 is our number here. So give us a call. There you go, bird feeding, a great reminder to keep uh, our feathered friends happy during the winter months. Right. So. Another great way to enjoy the landscape. Absolutely. 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 Okay, we're taking your phone calls, 703-387-1046. Uh, and David, our first caller is Jean, who's calling from Falls Church. Hi, Jean. Hi. How are you? Good morning, and welcome to 2013. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about snowdrops. Um, I think that Galantis is the um, actual name. Right, the little ones, and um, I, those are what my favorites because they they really do. If we ever get any snow, right. they really do come up in the snow. Yeah, they um, are great. I'm really in the mood for snow after seeing all these pictures. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I had a question about them. I am not. I, I, for some, I love them, but for some reason they don't they don't come up for me. And I've read different gardening books, and some of them say that they're dehydrated real easily so it's not good to plant them as bulbs in the fall. Have you ever heard that? No, I haven't. And I, they, you I, can I, buy them blooming, um, but I've never heard of anybody actually selling blooming um, snowdrops. Do you well, have any hints or, um, have, ha, you know, I know, that there, I know people just down the street from me who have massive, you know, beautiful drifts of snowdrops and I've got like three mm -hmm. so yeah now are so they're just dying and not coming up or do you even get the first season to bloom out of them right they're just dying like I'll plant um, you know I'll plant six and I'll get three that'll come up I mean I'm more suspect if you've got squirrels or chipmunks or some kind of um, little animals that might be digging them up and eating them I've I mean I've grown snowdrops for years in different locations I've never had that experience that type of problem okay um, I am you know we sell the bulbs in the fall and I would think that's a good time to be planting them yeah now to answer your question I mean we do in the spring in our annuals house by March we are selling you know bulbs that have been potted up and they're growing that I've seen the snowdrops or galanthus are usually included in combination with other you know, right. larger bulbs. I don't know that we would be selling just pots of galanthus, but right. it might be mixed with some, you know, miniature daffodils or something like that. Uh -huh. So that's an option that will be available to you in spring. Yeah, uh, right. Now, okay. I will say that any bulb, if it dries out, you know, that can kill that little flower and, uh, that's sure. in there. Sure, but we, you know, we have enough clay that it shouldn't be... Um, exactly, as long as you get them planted, you know, yeah. you, you're not you know, storing them indoors for any real length of time. Well, I think time. maybe your critter comment might be it. I think they're supposed to be um, 
They're supposed to be deer proof, I think, but that doesn't mean that they're squirrel proof, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So the, I would suggest maybe when you plant the bulbs, you might want to try spraying them with a repellent. You know, something like repels all or Bob X, you know, spray them. Let yeah. that, you know, sit on the bulb till it dries and then plant them and see if that corrects the problem. Yeah. We, yeah. I, I don't know, I didn't look at the inventory that closely yesterday. We might possibly even have some still in stock. Uh, so we're, or we still have some like leftover bulbs there at a discounted price. Um, it's not too late. If you don't mind getting out there in the cold, you know, if we have the bulbs, it's not too late to plant some and try to have them ready for, you know, this spring. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll get me a bottle of um, squirrel chaser, too. Yeah, but these happen real soon. So yeah. you know, give, okay, us, give we'll us a do. call at the store and check to see if we have any in oh, stock. Oh, okay, I will. Thanks so much. Okay, L thank love you. your show. Take Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Ed is calling from Fairfax. Hi, Ed. Yeah, hi. Uh, always enjoy your show. Thank oh, thank you. you. It's really great. Uh, David, I uh, want to ask you about the persimmon tree. Now, uh, I've noticed some, and the reason I planted one this fall, and the reason I see this nice, huge fruit around uh, the area, and I thought I'd, I'd like to get that. So, uh, but I have some questions about that uh, tree. Uh, the tag says it's a hachia. Uh, persimmon and that it's self-pollinating and it's uh, adaptable to, to zone 7. I don't know if we're a, a bona fide zone 7 area now due to the warm weather of the past uh, uh, and that it's the self-pollinating and is that really true and uh, how hardy will that tree be and uh, as far as if it isn't, if the pollination is not going to work I don't ha have any other fruit trees. I have a service berry nearby, but I'm not sure the flowers will be, uh, you know, blooming at the same time. Right. Anything you can tell me about that tree, I'd appreciate it. Well, first of all, let me say I, I don't consider myself an expert by any means with um, fruit trees and persimmons, but I'm learning about it because right. uh, these Asian persimmons, uh, there's such a demand for them that that's one of our best-selling fruit trees right now. Uh -huh. uh, they are self-pollinating. It's one of the easiest to grow. Nice thing is that they are disease resistant. They don't require the same amount of care that a lot of our other fruit trees that are in the rose family require. So I think you've made a good choice on a durable, reliable tree that doesn't require self-pollination. Uh, it seems like the biggest trick that we have with them is in terms of the fruit drop. Uh, they are a little bit sensitive to their watering. So the problem I encounter with them is a lot of times they, they blossom, they set fruit, the fruit's ripening, and then it dropping off the plant before it reaches maturity, which seems to be more related to the watering. Uh, I'm gonna give you uh, a name, I would say, if you wanna call our Fair Oak store and ask to speak with Paul McLean. He's probably our best fruit tree person. He knows a lot about persimmons. Because what I'm trying to remember is that they, they need to go through a little bit of dry or they need to be consistently moist. I think that they need uh, to be careful about overwatering during that fruit development time. But I'd rather you call and speak to Paul to get the details on that. Okay, great. Then I'll do that. Uh, yeah, but you made a good choice and it's just, you leave it alone for now, but, but let's touch base with Paul about the watering during that fruit ripening time. That's the only thing that's at all tricky with them. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck with take it. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have to take a quick break. So, uh, Beverly, uh, hang on. We'll be right back with you in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Okay, we're going to quickly try to get through some more of uh, these wonderful phone calls. Beverly is calling from Chantilly. Thanks for holding, Beverly. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you, and I just want to say we enjoy your show so much. Uh, we've lived in Chantilly for over 20 years, have visited Fair Oaks many, many, many Great. times, You're our neighbor. and have seen you and David there, <laughs> and speak with uh, the ladies are so helpful uh, in helping us try to uh, get our perennial garden in shape. 
And I'm thrilled that we've, we have many of the plants that you've shown today, and we're thrilled. Great. And oh, they're thank doing you. really well. But right now, we're trying to enjoy our house plants. And uh, over Christmas, we received a Christmas cactus. Oh, and nice. um, I've never had one before, and most of our indoor plants are doing really well. And I think this one is too, but I have one quick question. When the buds are finished blooming, do we just pick them off? Or do we let them fall? Or I tend to pick them off there because, as you know, with a Christmas cactus, once that blossom begins to wilt and droop, yes. it's really kind of unsightly. Uh -huh. uh, now, it will just fall off on its own. You don't have to clean it, but yes. it just detracts from the beauty of the plant. So I just kind of pinch them off as they go along. Uh -huh. uh, well, no, go ahead. Uh, it's an interesting plant, and uh, I think I, I will really enjoy it, but I just wasn't sure on how to take care of it. Well, that's why I was going to say, keep in mind, this is a tropical cactus. It's not like a desert cactus, because uh, when you say cactus, we always think of letting it go really dry. This one, you want it allowed to go slightly dry, but never get the point of total dryness. So it's going to need a little more attention to the watering than, say, a desert cactus does. Okay. So, so let it go not quite fully dry, you know, and so you'll need to watch the moisture on it. Uh, it's going to be easy to grow, basically. Um, also, it doesn't want to be out in the full sunlight like a desert cactus, you know, bright but indirect light. So kind of keep it slightly moist, bright, indirect light. The trick to getting it to rebloom is it needs to have warm days and cool nights. So what I like to do is during the summertime, grow it outdoors in light shade, uh, keep it outside, you know, let it get exposed to a little bit of chilling temperatures in the fall, then bring it back so indoors to the warmth of your home, and that's going to sort of trick it into flowering. But that'll be for um, late in the year. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, like I say, we just love your show and uh, love Merrifield and Fair Oaks. It's just, it's just fun uh, to go over there. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. your coming in to see us and also watching our program. Thanks. Okay, Take thank care. you. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Claire is calling from White Plains. Hi, Claire. Good morning, Debbie and David. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Um, I didn't uh, cut my fruit trees back in the um, fall. Is it too late to cut them back now? Oh, this, I mean, January, February is the perfect time to be doing that. So you didn't miss anything. Uh, that's one of your things that you do while they're dormant. So the idea is to be pruning them after the leaves have dropped and before the new growth uh, begins next spring. So what I do is January, February, I'm looking for one of those days when it's kind of 55 degrees out or something and sunny and you're cooped up indoors and that's the perfect time to go out and do your pruning. I have a, um, I have a medley plum. That usually starts blooming in February if the winter isn't really cold. Right. So, okay, January. So, right. right, sometime in January. And of course with those, you know, they've already set their flower buds so when you're pruning, you are cutting flower buds off so you kind of need to find the right balance of going in there and doing a little bit of thinning to uh, remove competing branches, uh, but not to the point of cutting all the growth back or anything, because then that will really diminish the flowering. Okay. Okay, yeah, excellent. But yeah, just look for a nice day. It's supposed to be like 60 degrees later this yeah. year, later this, this week, week or something. Yeah, it's great. That'd be the time to get out there and enjoy it. Take care, have a great right, weekend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, bye bye. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Sue is calling from Alexandria. Hi, Sue. Hey, Debbie David. Happy New Year to you both. Thanks. Oh, you thank too. You. I have um, a question on burning bushes. I have five between my driveway and the neighbors. Mm -hmm. They lost, uh, two of the five lost their leaves, like, say, July last year. And um, so I'm wondering, now, it, it, could I, should I trim them back? Should I prune them back pretty severely now and see if they come back? You know, just... Now, well, once know. they shed in July, did they they leaf out again later in the season, or just um, had they been bald since July? A couple leaves here and there, so I guess you could say they've been bald. Well, now, how how old are they? Um, let's see. I've been here probably eleven years ish plus. Okay. Of uh, that, that's that's unusual. I mean, now, can you tell if those plants are still alive? Um, well, they're all on. You know, all the leaves of. Um, dropped off them. Yeah. I mean, before um, 
well, last year, they all the leaves came back the way they were supposed to, but oddly enough, two of the three lost all their leaves. Yeah, I would, um, what I would do is I'd scratch under the bark, you know, that, and see if there's any green left in there. I'm concerned if those two plants are already dead. Okay. Um, and then it gets into the whole question, well, why, why did they die? So I would say the thing to do is if you're not certain, would maybe to cut a couple branches off, bring that into us, uh, along with maybe some photographs or something. I'm suspect there's something going wrong with plants. Those are tough, durable, easy care plants. You, to answer your question, you can prune them in the winter time uh, right now. And we'll have a show on winter pruning later, as well as class, classes on that. So you do want to do your pruning in the winter time, but I'm just concerned if you're pruning an already dead plant, and then that brings up why did it die. So bring some samples in, consult with us, and let's kind of investigate what's going on there in a little more detail. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Love okay. the show. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. Take care. Bye bye. Well, we've run out of time. Our apologies to Joseph. Oh, was uh, he I had a talking question. Too well, much? he had a question about evergreen tree leaning, so I'm not sure what his question was. But yeah, uh, again, it looks like all these are Virginia callers, yeah, right? So you can great. come into the garden Absolutely. center and we'll talk to you more detail. Then. Absolutely. Well, next week, uh, Renetta Holt, who's been on several times, is going to be with us, and we're going to be talking about landscape construction. Again, winter time's a great opportunity to get started in those projects mm -hmm. so you don't want to miss that program. Absolutely and we will have some uh, uh, and our, you mentioned the seminars as well so pick up a copy of the seminar schedule pick up a copy of our calendar uh, and we hope you have a great week and uh, we will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.